I'd like to welcome all the visitors and appreciate you coming and worshiping with us. Our order of service this morning will be uh, song service will be led by Brother Jeff Knott. Opening prayer will be led by Brother Van Herndon. Closing prayer will be led by Brother David Mullins. And center table will be led by Brother Billy Williams. Our scripture reading will be John 15, 12 through 17. I've got several mentioned on the sick list. As you can look around, we're kind of uh, scarce here this morning, but we got... Uh, Layla, which is the niece of Jim and Sandy uh, Ators, got a concussion. Uh, Lindsay and Brent Hollis uh, are homesick. Sarah Batten's grandmother is, I believe, still on a vent, and I think Sarah's also out of town going to check, go to be with her. Uh, Linda Seal's mom's still on hospice, and uh, the Maxwells have the flu, and Brenda Spencer's homesick, and then Miss Birdie has lost a hearing in uh, her right ear. Uh, also, out of town, we have Greg Lincoln and uh, owner with our kids in Clarksville and the Batsons. Uh, we will have a business meeting at uh, 10 minutes to 5 this evening. And then uh, Miss Lu uh, Sister Louise gave me this. It's an invitation for the Joy Group. This is a group of mature adults, all of the same uh, mind of spirit, to spread joy and inspiration to others around them. We would like you, everyone, to attend. It's a Valentine's potluck party, fellowship room in the basement, Friday night, February the 16th at 6 p.m. Just bring a dish and your Valentine, or just bring yourself. And also, uh, Miss uh, Tina does an excellent job. Grab a bulletin, because there's a, um, hey, it's got a lot of stuff going on. I didn't get to attend the meeting that we had this Friday, but I think there was a lot of things from our VBS to everything got discussed. So hopefully we'll, uh, Miss Tina's got it on here to where we can keep up with it. And song service will be there, Brother Jeff. And we do have some birthdays this week. William Herndon, April Rory, and Norma Compton all have birthdays this week. So let's wish them a happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy birthday. And we do have an anniversary this week. Daryl and Patricia Howell have an anniversary this week. So happy anniversary to them. At this time, we'll have our opening prayer. Would you please bow? Most loving and wonderful Heavenly Father, we come to you now in this avenue of prayer and we're thankful to you for everything that you have bestowed upon us in the way of blessings. We know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Father, we're thankful for this time to gather together as like-minded individuals and worship you and sing songs in your praise. And Father, we pray that Everything that we do here today is done in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight, it is done in spirit and in truth. Father, we ask that you be with those of our number who are sick, those who are attending to ill family members, those who are traveling. We ask that you watch over those and help those with their various afflictions and give strength and endurance to those who are tending to them. Father, we have visitors this morning. We are thankful for those visitors. Father, we pray that our service here can be uplifting to them, that they can glean importance from your word. And Father, we pray that each and every member of this congregation can be a blessing to them. Father, we have those that are traveling. We ask your blessings upon them for safe travels. Father, we ask your blessings upon Brother Terrence and his family for a long life of service in your kingdom. Father, we pray that you help us to open our minds to receive the message that is delivered to us today to help us to apply it, help us to test it, make sure that it is in accordance with your word and that we apply it to our lives and learn from it and help us to live as more mature Christians. Father, we pray that you help us all to realize that your scriptures say that they will know us, know your disciples, Christ's disciples, by the love that they have for one another and that you set a burning desire within us to show that love to each other and that it may be seen by the world so that they know that we are your disciples. 
Father, we know that from time to time we make mistakes, we transgress against you, we step outside of the path of your word, and Father, we ask that you, we humbly ask that you forgive us, and we're thankful that you have given us a way to find redemption and salvation through the gift of your son and his willingness to hang upon that cruel cross, and we are so very thankful for his sacrifice and for your love. Again, Father, go with us through this service. Watch over and care for us. These things we humbly pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Our first song will be We're Marching to Zion. <clears throat> Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. And thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion. The beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. The children of the heavenly king, the children of the heavenly king, they speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs about and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching Marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Our next song will be Heaven Will Surely Be Worth It All. Often I'm hindered on my way, burdened so heavy I almost fall. Then I hear Jesus sweetly say, Heaven will surely be it all. Heaven will surely be worth it all. Worth of the sorrows that here befall. After the life with all its strong
sorrows that here befall after the life with all its strife heaven will surely be worth it all toiling and pain I will endure till I shall hear the death angel call Jesus has promised and I'm sure heaven will surely be it all. Heaven will surely be worth it all. Worth all the sorrows that here befall after the light with all its strong surely be worth it all. We'll have our prayer for the offering. That one, please. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, indeed, thank you for this day. The many blessings that we bestow on a daily basis. We're mindful, Heavenly Father, of the blessings we have of our church family and our physical families and the things that we receive each day. We're mindful, Heavenly Father, of the great love that Thou had for us and Christ coming to earth and dying on the cross that we might have a home within the heaven and after a while. We're mindful, Heavenly Father, of the jobs that we have, that we make earnings, that we may give them back to the church here so that we might carry out our work here locally and abroad. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Him to help us prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper will be night with Evan Pitt. <clears throat> night with Evan Pinion brooded o'er the veil. All around was silent, save the night winds wail. When Christ the man of sorrows in tears and sweat and blood prostrate in the garden raised his voice to God smitten for offenses which were not his own. He for our transgressions had to weep alone. No friend with words to come.
comfort, nor hand to help was there. When the meek and lowly humbly bowed in prayer, have a father, father, if indeed it may, let this cup of anguish pass from me, I pray, yet if it must be suffered by me, thine only Son, have a Father, Father, let thy will be done. Please turn your Bibles to John 15, 12 through 17. John 15, 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So, Bass, we give thanks for the bread. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, mindful of what this represents to us as Christians, and the sacrifice that was made through us, through the Christ dying on the cross, we pray that we take of this bread, the body of Christ, in a way and a manner acceptable unto thee. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We give thanks for the cup. Also, Heavenly Father, reminding us of what this cup represents to us this, to this morning, uh, the blood of Christ, we pray that we may also take of it in a way and a manner acceptable unto thee. For this is our prayer in Christ's name.
next song will be He Gave Me a Song. If you would please stand while we use this song. <clears throat> he took my burdens all away up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. A wonderful song I now can sing In my heart joy bells ring He gave me a song A wonderful song He gave me a song To sing about He lifted me From sin and doubt Oh praise His name He is my King a wonderful song he is to me. Brighter the way grows every day, walk in the heavenly way. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. Praises to him, my king. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. I am redeemed no more to die, never to say goodbye. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. And some of these days in that fair land, singing with the chorus grand. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. morning and welcome everyone to our, our morning worship service at the Dover Church of Christ and a special welcome to all our visitors we have a lot of visitors with us this morning um, we're especially glad all our visitors especially those of you who bring little ones with you we're especially glad you're here so uh, for a couple months now on our uh, sermon series we've been talking about just kind of the special issues we face is families uh, the challenges kind of unique to, to raising kids in the faith to to being godly parents and there's no sense in really beating around the bush about it, but this week's topic is a little bit of a, a heavy one, and that is family trauma. And I bring this up because I bet in one way or another, this phrase, heavy as it is, applies to just about every family in here, uh, whether it's your parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sister, in-laws. I bet everybody has at least a member of their family who has dealt with serious trauma or perhaps because of one of those people I just listed you yourself are dealing with some amount of family trauma and this this word trauma gets thrown around a lot these days uh, personally I have a slight aversion to that word it's just it's so heavy it, it's uncomfortable talking about I don't like using it and, and I don't intend to get into a discussion of whether this situation or that situation really qualifies as trauma so I'll say this that I, that I guess most, if not all of us, have, have gone through some pretty serious stuff in our life. Or we know somebody in our family, as some part of our family, has dealt with just some pretty hefty stuff. And it afflicts them, afflicts them. It sticks with them emotionally, mentally. It affects them psychologically. And I know this is a pretty heavy way to start a Sunday morning, but the good news, the good news is that God's Word talks about this kind of stuff. So, so if you're with us this morning and, and there's already a specific issue, a certain situation with your family that is, that is weighing on the back of your mind, then number one, you can know you're not alone. In, in fact, I, I, I joked with someone earlier that there's going to be some people who think this lesson is specifically about them, but don't worry, it's not. It's uh, something I've been thinking about for a little while here. But neither are we spiritually alone. Because God's Word addresses 
the kind of problems that, that we would call uh, traumatic when it comes to our families. I want us to look at the story of Joseph this morning. Joseph's story is found in Genesis chapter 37. So if you kind of begin navigating there, if you have your Bibles or if you want to grab one in the pew. Uh, Joseph's story is unusually long as far as Bible stories go. Usually I like to deep dive into somebody in the Bible and kind of look at their whole story. But Joseph's story runs from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50. So we're not going to look at all of Joseph's story, at least not right now. But we're going to start with kind of the beginning part of Joseph's story with the opening verses of Genesis chapter 37. Beginning in Genesis 37, verse 1. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Jacob loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was his son of his old age. So, so Genesis 37 begins by saying, I'm going to tell you the, the history, the story, the account of Jacob. Which is weird because you might hear me saying, we're going to talk about Joseph's story, but, but Jacob is Joseph's father. There's many stories in Genesis about Jacob. Jacob is the one who wrestles with the angel. He is the one whom God renames Israel, which means I have struggled with God. And so Jacob slash Israel will, be, will become the founding father of really the nation of God's people. He's the originator before Moses, before the Exodus, before they even go down into Egypt. Really, the nation of Israel begins with the, the Israelites under Jacob. And the story, as Genesis 37 introduces, the story of Jacob begins with his youngest son, Joseph. And the text says Joseph was 17, that he was pasturing, he was tending to the flock. And it gives us the first detail about Joseph and his brothers, that some of them come from different mothers. And now this point isn't really going to be our focus, but we kind of already have our first wrinkle when we're talking about family dynamics, our first potential complication. If we read a little bit more in the text, we see that, that Joseph's father had 12 children by four different wives. And now I know many of us probably have a, come from blended families where maybe mom was married before and dad was married before and now we have this cheaper by the dozen Brady Bunch situation where we got to be one new family. But 12 children by four different mothers is certainly the groundwork for some potential issues already. But here comes the real problem. Verse 4, now Jacob loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age so Jacob slash Israel he felt very blessed by God to have a child when he was old when he was an older man and it's okay to feel blessed by God it's good to, to appreciate the blessings God gives us but because of this blessing the Bible says Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons can tell you, just right here from verse 4, without even getting into the rest of Joseph's story, that this is probably not going to end well, right? That this doesn't sound great already, that when parents start playing favorites with their children, when they begin to be inconsistent on things like discipline and, and conditional with their love towards their children, we, we already have a recipe for really family disaster. And so it should not surprise us, when we read a little bit about Joseph, that that Joseph's brothers resented him. And it shouldn't surprise us to learn that Joseph's brothers loathed him. They despised the position that he held with their father. And if you think about this, if you're one of the older 11, you've been competing with your brothers for your dad's attention, for your dad's favor, for your dad's love your whole lives. And there's this, this infighting between the, the sons of this mother versus the sons of this wife and the, the fighting between these groups of step-siblings and one another. And then this baby boy, Joseph, comes along. And just because dad was an old man when he had Joseph, suddenly Joseph is now the favorite? No. That's not, that's not going to work. And you see, Jacob, Jacob, their father, I think, thought nothing of doing this 
Because we take a look at their little family tree, we might find out a little bit if we study Jacob's family that this was just actually how things went in Jacob's family. You see, down here we have, we have Joseph, who, who God calls Israel, who the Israelites come from. We have all of Joseph's brothers, and, and, and then his father is, of course, Jacob, as we talked about. But Jacob had a brother. Jacob had a brother named Esau. Maybe you've heard their story. Maybe you've heard about Jacob and Esau when, when they were younger. How Jacob scammed Esau out of his birthright as the oldest. Or perhaps how Jacob deceived their father in, into blessing him instead of his brother. But I want you to read you another passage from Genesis from a little bit earlier, from Genesis 25, 27, about Jacob and Esau, the, the, the father and the uncle of Joseph. From Genesis 25, 27, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So Jacob and Esau are twins. Rebekah is their mother. Isaac is their father. And Esau says that he was an Old Testament man's man. You know, he, he ate the wild game. He, he hunted. He killed. He was gruff. He was probably tall and, and rugged, and he was red and hairy. He was really a, a guy, you know, the Old Testament sense. It says Jacob was quiet. He kept to himself. He wasn't very social, but he liked to stay inside the tent. And so Esau, of course, is, he likes to do the, the guy things. He's their father's favorite. And Jacob, the text says, was, was a mama's boy. Jacob was their mother's favorite. Does it sound familiar? Parents playing favorites with their children. If we look at Jacob and Esau's father, Isaac, maybe you've heard Isaac's story. Isaac's father, Abraham, almost sacrificed him on a mountaintop. We can get into a little bit of that story. But just so we understand everything that has happened before Joseph's story begins in Genesis 37, at, at the, the very top, great-grandfather, we have Abraham, who loved his son Isaac but almost killed him. And then Isaac preferred his oldest son Esau, so Jacob tricked everybody and ran away. And then Jacob had four wives but 12 different children, and then he loved the youngest son, and all the brothers hated him. Am I painting like a really sound, healthy, good family dynamic? Anybody think, yeah, that sounds like a really good place to start the story of a godly young man? probably heard the stories of Abraham and Isaac or the stories of Jacob and Esau or Joseph in the coat of many colors in Sunday school before. The Sunday school version doesn't tell you the part where we all need to go to family counseling afterwards. What we have in Genesis, really what we have in this part of Genesis is generation after generation of family trauma. And as we read about these stories, it's easy to gloss over, it's easy to miss, but it's kind of hard to imagine that this is the family lineage. These are the kinds of people that God will choose to be his. Isn't that interesting? You know, maybe because of your own life, these family situations aren't that hard to imagine at all. And you've thought, man, I just have some serious family drama going on right now. You know, if you ever hear parents speak positively uh, about the person their child is dating or they're engaged to or their spouse, they, they, they might say something like, well, they come from a good family. You know, we know their parents. We know their grandparents. We, they just come from a really good family. And, and what we're kind of suggesting is we think there's a good chance things will work out for them because their family gives us a good idea of their relationship. We think their relationship will be good because their family is constructed of other good, healthy relationships. Or in the opposite case, we might express concern or hesitation or worry because their, their partner, their spouse, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, they don't come from a good family, quote unquote. And what we're saying there is, I'm just, I'm not sure about how this is going to work. You know, I'm not sure that that family has a lot of problems. I'm not sure about their parents. Things often don't work out for people in their family. And if this second description fits your family a little bit better, then the stories of Genesis in chapter 25, chapter 37, chapter 40 are good news. Because a family where, where brothers don't speak to one another for 20 or 30 years, 
where they've literally tried to kill one another. A family where one person sells another person off into slavery and leaves them for dead is actually exactly the kind of family that God looks at and he says, these will be my people and I will be their God. Isn't that kind of incredible? Like he doesn't, he, we would think God searched the whole earth and he found the best stock, you know, the married parents, grew up together, two and a half kids, just as the, the picture portrays, and he found the good stock to start his covenant people, right? No, he chose a family that was a mess. He, the, the kind of family that nobody would want their daughter marrying into is the kind of family God looks at and forms a very significant covenant relationship with. I'm not an expert. But when we look at the stories of Genesis, it kind of seems like we have a lot of men who have no idea how they should treat their sons. And so men who, who grow up to be deeply flawed fathers, and then they raise boys who don't really know how to be fathers, who they are deeply flawed and emotionally problematic. And, and then it keeps going and keeps going one generation to the next. Except for our study this morning, Joseph. Joseph breaks free of this, this cycle, this pattern. So what's different about Joseph? What is it about Joseph that allows him to succeed in spite of his family? That's what I want us to see from Joseph's story this morning. As I mentioned, Joseph's story runs from about Genesis 37 to chapter 50. So we're going to jump around and just hit a few highlights, read a few verses here and there. But as we look through some of these verses this morning, I, I want us to see how Joseph escaped family trauma. In chapter 37, as we read, his, his story begins, in the rest of that chapter, his story begins where his brothers sell him off to slavery. His brothers, they, they consider leaving him for, the, for dead, and they say, what profit is that to us? We'll just sell him for some money instead of actually killing him. And so Genesis 39 tells us about how he landed in Egypt and how Joseph was the, he actually was a servant and the captain of the guard in Egypt. And if we looked over to, to Genesis chapter 39, Genesis 39 verse 2, says when Joseph is serving the, the captain of the guard as a slave, it says that the Lord was with Joseph, that he became a successful man, that he was in the house of his Egyptian master. The master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed. Joseph remained faithful. Even though Joseph's own family, his own brothers and sisters, took him out into the desert, dropped him in a well, pulled him back out, sold him into slavery, and told their father he was dead, Joseph remains faithful. And as we see in his story in Genesis 39, as a result of his faithfulness, the Lord finds favor with Joseph. And in fact, so much so that Potiphar, the man in whose house he is serving, this man notices Joseph's faithfulness. Joseph's faith becomes an example to those around him. And in fact, if we look at his story, Potiphar's wife, she, she tries to entrap him. She tries to uh, seduce him. She tries to trick him. And Joseph's response is, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It's from Genesis 39, verse 9. We see Joseph is faithful. Even in times of desperation, even in times of temptation, even at what certainly seems like the lowest point in his life so far, Joseph has remained steadfast in his faith. Well, then, of course, despite him resisting the temptation, the things get worse for Joseph. He is falsely accused and he's thrown in prison all the same. And if you're following, you might think, well, surely this is where Joseph's faith runs out, right? Surely, now that he's a slave and he's being thrown into a slave's prison, now certainly Joseph breaks. But if we look at verse 21, if we look at verse 21 in Genesis chapter 39, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And in fact, verse 23 says, He found so much favor that it said the keeper paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because he knew the Lord was with Joseph. So again, Joseph's faith is so strong that it's actually become an example to everyone he's around. Even as a servant, even in prison, even in a faraway land, taken from his home, Joseph remains faithful to God. 
And in turn, God remains faithful to Joseph. In our evening services tonight, we're going to explore a little bit of Joseph's story here. I know I'm skipping a lot of ground and I'm moving kind of quickly, but I want us to have some discussion on how he, he works his way up the ladder here. But if we look, kind of skim through the, the chapters in Genesis, the next few chapters tell us how, how Joseph not only got his way out of prison where he was wrongfully accused, he gets back into the servant of the captain of the guard. And from the captain of the guard, he becomes a servant to Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh is the, the king, the leader of the Egyptian empire. Joseph finds himself in a place of great influence, interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh. And when he interprets the dreams of Pharaoh and, and, give, and gives credit to God for these dreams, he begins to gain Pharaoh's trust. And when he gains Pharaoh's trust, Pharaoh actually gives to him great authority in the land of Egypt. And the text tells us that over time, a great famine, famine comes across the land. And of course, Egypt is really the world power at the time. They have all the money. They have all the food. They have the storehouses. They have the crops. And as the years go by, guess who makes their way from Canaan all the way down to Egypt to ask for some wheat and some grain and some food in this time of great famine? But Joseph's brothers. And when they come down, Joseph shows his brothers incredible forgiveness. Turn to Genesis chapter 45. I want to read from you Genesis chapter 45, beginning in verse 1. When Joseph has his confrontation with his family, it says, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Joseph is so overcome with emotion that he essentially says, clear the room. I want everybody out, all the guards, all of the administrators under Pharaoh, everybody leave. And he's alone in the room with his brothers, and he, he reveals his identity. A lot of time has gone by. Presumably his brothers don't recognize him. But, but they can't, Joseph cannot contain his emotions, and so he says, I am Joseph. But the brothers, you notice their reaction, the brothers become very scared. The text says they're, they're fearful because after all this time, they think Joseph is seeking to harm them. But if we look at Joseph, verse 4, Joseph said, Come near to me. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. The famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. You see, after Joseph had earned favor with Pharaoh, Joseph's primary job in this time of famine was he was, he was really the administrator over food, over the storehouses of grain. And so part of his job was to decide how much food everybody got during the famine and really to decide who got food and who didn't. And the brothers who sold him into slavery are very fearful that this man who is in charge of their food is going to remember that time that they sold him into slavery. Joseph says, do not be dismayed or angry. He says, because God has sent me here to preserve life. He says, I believe God put me here so that I could help you in this time of need. He says, I know you tried to kill me, but I think actually what I should do right now is I should save your lives and your family's lives. That's a level of forgiveness that I can't even really wrap my brain around, to be honest. It's incredible. One of the reasons Joseph is breaking free of this cycle of trauma in his family it is one of the biggest reasons that, that we pass along the hurt in our family from one generation to the next is so often because deep down we cannot forgive the hurt that was done to us. And so we carry it like a burden. 
But we carry it around with us. We carry it into adulthood. We carry it as we become parents to our children. And without realizing it, we pass along this same hurt to them. And Joseph very easily could have taken revenge against his brothers. He could have struck them down. He could have let them starve. He could have really humbled them now that the slave has found his way to be a king. But Joseph says, why are you so upset? Of course, I'm going to help you. Because he said, God has put me here to preserve life. Which really segues us nicely to our last point. Joseph believes ultimately that he is not lost and he is not alone in the world. We sing, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Joseph was somebody who was found. Joseph was somebody who knew, who saw very clearly his purpose in life, and he had found his purpose in God. If we learn anything new about Joseph's story this morning, I want you to see how his story ends. Turn with me all the way to Genesis chapter 50. It's the last chapter in the book. Joseph and his brothers are reunited and they kind of work through the famine together. Joseph goes back and he visits his father and he gets word that his father's very sick and he's ailing and he's been uh, really just slowly dying for a long time. And so towards the end of his story, Joseph goes back home to be with his father, Jacob. And his father passes away. And so J Joseph is here in their homeland with his brothers and, and he's gone back so that he can bury his father with his ancestors. And after the funeral, after the burial, as they turn to make their way back to Egypt, remember where all the food and the grain is kept, this is where Joseph's brothers begin to be very, very afraid. Because they begin to fear that, well, out of his love for our father, maybe Joseph has just been holding back. And that, you know, now that dad has passed on, now Joseph's really going to exact his revenge on us. Now Joseph is really going to let it loose. And they, and they get it in their heads that Joseph has just been waiting for their dad to pass so that he can seek revenge on all his brothers who have done him wrong so many years ago. But look again at how Joseph responds. This is from Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, then they say, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave his command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because of the evil they did to you. And please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. His brothers, they, they come before Joseph and they're, they're begging. They're saying, don't harm us. Please forgive us. We'll, we'll do whatever you want. We'll be servants in your household. We'll be your slaves if we have to. But just please forgive this evil that we have done to you. And in return, Joseph issues what I think is one of the most powerful lines in all of Scripture. And he says, you have meant it as evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive just as they are today. Just as he told them when they first came seeking his help, Joseph said, not only do I forgive you, but he says, I want to remind you that God has a purpose for me. You see, Joseph understood on a deep fundamental level that his life was ultimately not about him. Joseph understood that, that his life was more than searching for his own happiness. It was more than his own relationships, his own success, or his own goals, or his own wealth. Joseph understood that the point of his life was to serve God's purposes. And he says, I have identified a long time ago that God put me here to bring my people life. 
God remembered the covenant of Abraham, the covenant of Isaac, the covenant given to Jacob, the covenant given to him, that this people will be a remnant for God, that they will be a nation to God, and God will be faithful to them if they remain faithful to God. And so Joseph understood that his point was not to achieve happiness or peace on his own terms, to have revenge or justice as he sees fit, but that his purpose was to give God's people life. And so at the end of it all, Joseph is able to be truly at peace. Joseph is able to, to look at the men who tried to kill him, not just any men, but his own flesh and blood, and say, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. That's not just forgiveness. That's telling somebody that, that you don't have the power to, to harm me or to change my direction in life because God has ordained a direction in my life that is much bigger than you and it's much bigger than me. In the New Testament, Paul references this story in Romans 8. In Romans 8, 28, he, he makes the point that even in the darkest of times, even when people seek evil and plot against us, just like Joseph, God can take those situations and work a powerful, wonderful good out of them for those who seek his purposes. But when you love and you serve God, God gives you a new purpose in life. He gives you a new direction in life. And when you serve God, your life is filled with new meaning. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. When we are in Christ, Paul talks extensively that when we are in Christ, there's a regeneration that happens. This regeneration happens that when we are baptized into Christ, he gives us new purpose. And in Romans 6, 4, he says, we were buried with him in baptism through death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. In God, you can separate yourself from your family trauma. The baggage and the problems and the things and the habits and vices and the ways of thinking that have been passed down from generation to generation can be put off. If we are faithful, if we are forgiving, and if we find our purpose in him, then we cleanse ourselves from the blood of Christ. And we too have the promise of walking in newness of life. If you're with us this morning and you feel like your life has been defined by your problems, by the things that have been passed down, by the, the, the hurt that has been done to you. And you're looking to that regeneration that Paul promises, that God promises through his word. If you're looking for baptism, for salvation, if there's anything we can pray for you or do for you, won't you come at this time while we stand and while we sing? Today, why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today, Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed, he will not turn thee away. Calling today, calling today. is calling is tenderly calling today Jesus is pleading no oh, list to his voice hear him today hear him today they who believe on his name shall rejoice quickly and away call today, calling today, Jesus is calling, is Tim.
tenderly calling today. Thank you for being here today. Men, don't forget about our uh, business meeting at 4.50 this afternoon. <clears throat> our closing hymn will be, This World is Not My Home. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior, pardon me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore.